Well, good morning, everyone. I apologize that I did not have a uh, jig prepared to go along with that catchy intro there. You just have to picture that in your own mind. Well, no, that's a bad pick. No, I'm sorry. Don't do that. Don't do that. Well, as uh, Todd mentioned at the beginning of the service, uh, we're in the midst of uh, our Sunday morning sermons of a series we're calling Advent Conspiracy. And uh, I don't know if you think it's a cool name or not, but either way, we didn't come up with it. Uh, it was actually a movement that was started by a number of churches, churches about 10 years ago or so that uh, got together and they decided that they wanted to challenge believers to celebra celebrate Christmas humbly and generously. One of the things that they discovered uh, is that annually in the United States of America, we spend about $450 billion on Christmas gifts and food and decorations and, and everything that goes along with it. <clears throat> so uh, for believers, the challenge is instead of just thinking about how you're going to celebrate it and make it special for you and your family and your loved ones and your friends, that you also think about the needy in your community. So here at FBC, the way that we're responding to this Advent Conspiracy Challenge is to partner with five local ministries, <clears throat> excuse me, partner with five local ministries and uh, challenge each of you to take some of the money that you would have spent on yourself or your friends or loved ones and spend it instead, <coughs> excuse me, spend it instead uh, in supporting one of these ministries. Uh, Todd ran through them, but let me just run through them quickly once again. There is a legacy closet which provides clothes and toys and school supplies for families with foster children. There's Christmas for the least of these, which provides Christmas gifts and other much needed items for foster children and their families. There is Hannah House Ma Maternity Home, which takes in pregnant women in crisis and provides them with home, clothing, food, medical care, spiritual guidance. The Weighted Blanket Sewing Ministry makes uh, custom weighted blankets for foster and adopted kids in East Texas. And uh, for those of you who may not be aware of this, uh, weighted blankets actually help to reduce anxiety and stress. And of course, kids that are in this system are undergoing a lot of stress due to the trauma that caused them to be in the system in the first place. And then finally, uh, there's Beds of Hope, which <clears throat> provides beds and related items like mattresses, pillows, and blankets uh, for kids in CPS care. So uh, there's a, the desk that's to my left in the foyer where you can go and get them more information if you need to or where you can give as well or you can find out any specific needs that they might have that you could provide for. So let's, uh, let's rejoice in the birth of Christ by showing the love of God to the needy in our community. Now the, uh, the Advent Conspiracy sermons have been built around four key concepts in this uh, Advent Conspiracy movement and they are, actually I better read these, I'm going to get them mixed up. Worship fully spend less, give more, and then today we'll be focusing on love all. Uh, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 22, verse 34, if you want to go ahead and turn your Bibles there. Since uh, this sermon is going to be focused on love, I, I'm not, I was not easily able to use uh, a Dallas Cowboys opening illustration because I'm not <laughs> feeling a lot of love there right now. But here's what I want you to think about. Life is complicated. Think for just a minute about the number of decisions that you've made in the past week. And obviously they range from trivial to very important because some of the decisions you made were as light as, you know, what, what outfit were you going to wear that day or where you were going to eat lunch. Uh, but there are more momentous ones you make as well, of course, like how you're going to react to a particular issue with a friend or how you're going to uh, pursue your job or your schoolwork or something like that, uh, whether you're going to study for your final exam or stay up and watch another season of Doctor Who. <laughs> Any college students? <clears throat> now, because life is so complicated, sometimes decision-making is, is very difficult. You know, it's not always clear to know, okay, what, what path should I pursue? How should I respond to a given situation? And that's why every society on earth has Proverbs. Because Proverbs help us to focus on simple truths to clarify what we need to do in navigating life. One of my dad's favorite Proverbs was a Russian proverb that was this, to dwell on the past is to lose one eye. 
To forget the past is to lose both eyes. I don't know what that means, but it sounds good. <laughs> so Proverbs, what they do is they have a way of kind of simplifying life into broad categories to make it easier to, to make decisions, to work with things. So instead of thinking about the 50 aspects of a given decision, a good proverb helps you focus on just one or two. <clears throat> but Proverbs have limitations because they're general truths. They're not absolute truths. In, generally, in general, this is the case. That's why Proverbs can actually sometimes contradict one another. For instance, one old proverb is, he who hesitates is last. But that works directly against the other proverb that says, look before you leap. So you're supposed to hesitate, you're not supposed to hesitate, right? And believe it or not, this actually happens in Scripture as well. In Proverbs chapter 26, verses 4 and 5, it says this, Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him yourself. And then the next verse says, answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. So you need wisdom to figure out which proverb to apply to a given situation. So you, the, the complication that the uh, proverb was supposed to solve can sometimes come back up again when you're trying to figure out which proverb to use. <clears throat> the point is this, we sometimes need something stronger than just a general proverb, some, just some general direction. And thankfully, God has provided that. All throughout his word, God has provided direct commands. This is what you should do. This is how you are supposed to behave. This is something you should avoid. This is something you should embrace. But, again, because life is so complicated, we actually get into situations where it look like God's commands are at odds with one another. One of the most famous examples is in Exodus chapter 1 when uh, the Pharaoh had ordered the midwives that were attending the Hebrew women to kill any babies, any male babies that were born. <clears throat> and as you know the story, the midwives didn't do that. And then when the Pharaoh asked them why, they came up with a lie to cover what they were doing so that they could continue saving these babies. It's wrong to lie and it's wrong to murder. So which one of these commands is more important than the other when they seem to be in conflict? <clears throat> in Matthew chapter 22, Jesus actually faces that exact question. Which command is more important than the other command? So let's look at how he answered it. Uh, turn with me to verses 34 to 40. Just follow along as I read. It should be on the screen as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees... They gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Now, this interaction takes place just a few days before Jesus was crucified. And it's one of many confrontations that Jesus had in this final week leading up to his death. After his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, he then uh, cleansed the temple, chased out the money changers and those who were selling doves. And then all of these groups that were in uh, different levels of power in Israel, began attacking him and confronting him in one way or another. For instance, uh, the chief priests and the scribes confronted him, and then he was confronted by the chief priests and the elders. After that, he was questioned by the Pharisees and the Herodians. Then he was questioned by the Sadducees. And now, in this passage, once again, he's being questioned by the Pharisees. Verse 34 says, But when the Pharisees heard that he had alienated... Excuse me, where did I come up with that word? When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered. It doesn't even look, it's not even, I don't know what's happening there. <clears throat> I'm, I might have to have an emergency meeting with Justin Ward after this. He's an uh, eye doctor, for those of you who are wondering. Let me try that again. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. Now, this is really interesting. Matthew's arrangement of these, these different episodes uh, that are occurring in these last few days of Jesus' life show that what was happening is the different groups were just taking turns, taking shots at Jesus. 
one would go in and, and confront him, and if that didn't work, then the next one would move in, and they just, it was like wave after wave of people uh, trying to do something to stop Jesus. Now, if you think for a second about these groups, chief priests and scribes and elders, Rhodians, Sadducees, Pharisees, what were they trying to do? Why were they even challenging Jesus? Why did they question him? Why did they confront him? What were they trying to do? Well, they were trying to stop him. They were trying to end his ministry and end his influence in the lives of the people of Israel. <clears throat> and the reason is because Jesus challenged their beliefs as well as their power and their control over the people of Israel. And so they wanted to do whatever it took to discredit him in the eyes of the people so that therefore his influence would be taken away. And of course, as you know how the story ends, eventually they decided, well, we've just got to kill him to get him out of the way. But at this point, they're just trying to, to trick him and, and uh, discredit him, get him to use his words to uh, cause him to lose respect in the eyes of the people. Now, I do encourage you to read chapters 21 and 22 this week and just look at how brilliantly Jesus answered every single challenge and every single question. It just his, his insight into, into scripture, his understanding of human nature, it's absolutely beautiful to watch. And, and uh, so I encourage you to do that. In today's passage, the Pharisees came up with a question that they thought would, would help discredit him. So this Pharisee lawyer, which means an expert in the law of Moses, he asked Jesus, Teacher, which is the great commandment of the law? <clears throat> now, there's no way for us to know why the Pharisees came up with this particular question. Uh, it was common in those days for this to be a debated question because, as I mentioned, Life is complicated. Okay, there's, there's this group of commands. There's this group of commands. I sometimes get into a situation where they seem to conflict. So which command is more important? <clears throat> and so that was a question that was going around. So it was natural that someone might want to know the answer to it. <clears throat> but why would the Pharisees think that asking him this question would possibly discredit him in the eyes of the people? I don't know. I really don't like <laughs> I could not find a good answer, uh, even, even somebody taking a good stab at that. I, I assumed that they were just hoping that by at least getting him in, into a debate publicly, that therefore they could show that, hey, we know Scripture as well as, as he does. We're as godly as he is, and so maybe uh, they would discredit him in that regard. I don't really know what they were thinking, but this is the question they came up with. Now, when it says that this lawyer asked him a question to test him, that word test can have a positive or a negative connotation. You know, it's, it's one thing to test someone trying to get them to fail. We know that by and large, the Pharisees hated Jesus. And so when they were testing him, their intent was, we want him to trip up. So we're going to keep coming up with tests until we get him to trip up. But the book of Mark uh, has a parallel passage to this, this episode, and he gives a little more detail. And in there, he explains, well, or I should say, brings out that this lawyer apparently was sincere in his question. Because when Jesus gives his answer, the lawyer basically says, hey, that's, that's a good answer. And at one point, Jesus tells the lawyer, you are not far from the kingdom of God. So I think the, in the, lawyer, the lawyer's case, his desire to test was a sincere desire to test his wisdom and insight and to see if he was indeed a man of God. Be that as it may, uh, he asked this question. And then Jesus, almost surprisingly, gives a direct answer. Because how many times throughout the Gospels has Jesus asked a question and he answers with another question? Or he answers in a way that sort of reframes what the, what the person was asking in the first place. But this time, he just straight up answers it. He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. He's quoting Deuteronomy 6, 5, which is the uh, second half of what's called the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul. In the uh, translations of the Old Testament, usually says might. Here it says mind. Uh, he adds, excuse me, and, and in Mark, it, he adds strength. The point being that the whole person, you're supposed to love God with your whole person, not just any uh, one particular aspect of who you are. And then he adds a bonus. He says, and the second is like it. Now, the lawyer didn't ask him the first and second. He just wanted to know, number one, okay, what have I got to keep in mind to navigate life? And so he tells him that, but then he adds the second one. And he says, the second is like this, love your neighbor as yourself. And there he's quoting uh, Leviticus 19, 
verse 18. And then he adds this very interesting phrase. All the law and the prophets depend on these two commandments. Now that phrase, the law and the prophets, that uh, was a shorthand way of referring to the Old Testament. So he's saying the entire Old Testament, all the commands that are given in the entire Old Testament, all those hundreds of commands, they ultimately are based upon these two. Love God and love your neighbor. And just like getting a really good proverb, Jesus has just handed us a key to navigating life. He said that God commands us to love him and to love our neighbor and that these two commands are the two most important ones to keep in mind. Obedience to God in its simplest form is loving him and loving our neighbor. So since Jesus boiled this down so nicely for us, let's explore these two statements. First statement, the greatest command is to love God. The greatest and first command, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the fundamental thing that God is telling us to do. This is the fundamental requirement that he has for us. What does it mean to love? <clears throat> Think about that for just a second. When you're talking about things or activities, to love means to take pleasure in or to delight, to delight in. Like, I love homemade pizza, or I love frisbee, or I love hiking in the woods. But when you're talking about love between persons, it seems like it should be more than that, doesn't it? Let's start with God's love. God's the source of love, and so our understanding of love should be derived from Him. And by the way, not only is God the source of love, and not only is God loving, but the Bible says that God is love. The uh, senior high... Youth, we've been going through the attributes of God recently, and one of the attributes that uh, we looked at was simplicity. And that means that God is not made up of parts. He's not put together or assembled. He is, God is just, in his essence, he is nothing but God. God is purely God. And so one of the things that means, and it's okay if you don't understand this statement because I don't, so I won't explain it to you. One of the things that means, though, is that God actually is his attributes. So that's why we can say, and that's why the Bible says, God is love. Love isn't just something he decided, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to do this thing called love. It is who he is. It is his essence. God is love. <clears throat> and theologian Wayne Grudem defines love this way. Self-giving for the benefit of others. Love is giving of yourself for the good of others. And that has been happening within the triune God for all eternity. For instance, in John 17, 24, Jesus says that the Father loved him before the foundation of the world. And what did that mean? Was the Father like bringing gifts to Jesus? Well, that does happen from time to time. But he was giving of himself to Jesus, sharing his life, sharing his love, sharing his joy, <clears throat> giving of himself to Jesus. And that was a blessing to Jesus. The Father and the Son and the Spirit all giving of themselves to one another. Since God is love, and since God is Father, Son, and Spirit, we can be certain that the three persons of the Godhead have for all eternity been giving of themselves to one another. So that's what it means to love, to give of yourself for the benefit of another. Well, let's apply that to us. If self-giving for the benefit of others is love, then we live, love God by giving of ourselves for his benefit or for his good. But that sounds a little bit weird, doesn't it? Because what does God need? Y'all can answer this out loud. Absolutely nothing. That's right. God lacks nothing. He's perfectly content, perfectly happy, has always been for all eternity and always will be. He is the source of all things, and therefore there's nothing that he needs from us because he's the one who created everything that is. So in the unique case of God, when we talk about giving of ourselves for his benefit... We're talking about pleasing him or delighting him. Because there's nothing that he needs that we can give to him, but we can give to him delight or pleasure. And maybe the easiest way to think about it is that you and I can love God by blessing him. Have you ever had a time when someone blessed you? Or, I shouldn't have said that. All of you have, I know. Think about in the past month, the last time somebody blessed you and it just really was really great to you. Usually what happens is, Someone will say something to you, like encourage you, like, man, Slade, you are so handsome. <laughs> or some, someone will compliment how you're dressed or maybe your, your character or something that you did. Uh, like, I'm going to bless somebody right now. 
Kathy, you did a phenomenal job organizing this very Merry Christmas party we did last night. Yes, she deserves that. She did most of the heavy lifting on that, and it was absolutely great. So uh, that's one of the ways that we bless people, but we can actually bless God as well. Psalm 145, 1 and 2 says, I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. So we bless God by praising him, by lifting him up, by glorifying him, and that is how we love God. We also love God by obeying him. John 14, 31, Jesus said, I do as the Father has commanded me so that the world may know that I love the Father. And remember that loving God involves our entire being. It isn't just your mind. It isn't just your emotion. It isn't just your strength. It is all of you, your entire person, you are to love God. God is trying to emphasize that <clears throat> we love him entirely with our whole person. So you love God by treating him as God. You love God by giving him the affection and the glory that he deserves. We love God by trusting him, praising him, obeying him, and serving him. Now let's look at the second statement that Jesus made. The second greatest commandment, the second greatest command is to love your neighbor. Second greatest command is to love your neighbor. In the Gospel of Luke, where Jesus talks a bit about this great command, you'll recall that a guy said, well, who's my neighbor? And in, in Luke, it said he was trying to justify himself because basically he wanted to define neighbor very narrowly so that he can make sure he's fulfilling this command but still very comfortable and not having to sacrifice anything. And Jesus then told him the parable of the Good Samaritan. And at the end of that parable, he didn't say the, the uh, injured man was the Samaritan's neighbor. He asked the lawyer, who was neighbor to the injured man? And the lawyer said, well, the one who showed mercy to him. And Jesus said, go and do the same thing. So our neighbor actually is anybody that crosses our path. And God is saying you show love to anybody that crosses your path and you love them in the same way that you love yourself. Naturally, we look out for our own good. Naturally, we try to meet our own needs. That's what you do for other people, regardless of who crosses your path. <clears throat> Ephesians 5.20 says, No one ever hated his own flesh, but cherishes it, excuse me, nourishes and cherishes, cherishes it. Loving people as yourself means giving of yourself for the good of others. We relentlessly work for our own good and for our own benefit. And God is saying, okay, take that, that motivation for good and flip it from always looking at yourself to looking at the people around you and work for their good, do what is for their benefit. That's one of the reasons why Scripture puts so much emphasis on believers doing good works. Titus 2.14 says, and let our people learn to devote themselves to good works. Matthew 5, 16, said, Jesus said, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Lutheran pastor Chris Rosebro is fond of saying this, God doesn't need your good works. Your neighbor does. We don't, we love, excuse me, we do. We love our neighbors by doing good works for them. So for instance, giving to one of the ministries that I mentioned earlier that is a good work. That is meeting a need that someone has. That is giving of yourself for the benefit of another. Treating the short-tempered checker at Albertsons with patience. Babysitting for a young couple that has no family nearby. Serving a meal for, a college, for the college age group who are always hungry. What's up with that? <laughs> Thinking a lot does use a lot of calories. It's, I can attest to that. Don't think about just what's good for you, but think about what is good for others. Do not live a self-centered life is what God is commanding us. In other words, notice the people around you and do what is good for them, even at cost to yourself. So here's the bottom line for life on earth. It's not a proverb. It's actually two commands. We should love God with our whole being and love people just as we love ourselves. But that brings up the problem. You can't love God and love people. Now, I realize on the face of it, that sounds a little bit ridiculous. But remember the conditions that God added to help us understand what he meant by this. Love God with your entire being and love people as yourself. <clears throat> you and I and every person on earth are born with a sin nature. It's our nature to do what is wrong. It is our nature to love ourselves more than we love God. It is our nature to be self-centered instead of loving 
when we interact with others. Ephesians 2, 3 says that we and the rest of mankind are by nature children of wrath. Our, nat our natural relationship with God is that of an enemy, rebelling against his good rule and therefore living under his wrath. Psalm, one four, uh, excuse me, Psalm 14, 2 and 3 says this, The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. Naturally, you do not love God. And if you get awakened to the truth that you should love God, you discover that you cannot love him as he commands with your whole being. God's requirement is perfect love all the time. Are there any avid golfers in here? Just raise your hand if you're an avid golfer. That means you play five, six times a year at least. <laughs> okay, there's a couple of you. Okay, so, so think about it like this. A lot of times we go through life, especially like with God's commands, and, and what we tend to think of is, well, it's kind of like playing 18 holes of golf. I've just got to make par, and then I'm good. By the way, any of, these, any of you avid golfers, have you ever gotten par on 18 holes? Yeah, may, a little, maybe. <laughs> With a mulligan or two? <laughs> but that's not God's requirement. God is not saying make par. No, he's not saying be a pretty good golfer. His requirement is you've got to hit a hole in one on every hole. You need to score an 18. Anybody ever done that? No, because it is absolutely humanly impossible and in the same way, it is humanly impossible to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength all the time. <laughs> I'm passing out business cards. Excuse me. Okay. It is impossible to love God with your whole being all the time. But that is the standard that he is lifting up. So let's think about our neighbor. Can you love your neighbor as yourself? Can you love every person that you encounter as yourself every day? Well, no, you can't. Our natural state is to be self-centered, like I mentioned earlier. Our natural state is to be selfish. Our natural state is to vent when we are upset. Our natural state is to lash out when we are attacked. We naturally do what we think is best for us, not for others. We naturally use other people for our good without considering their good. Galatians 5 says that we are naturally prone to strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, and envy. Do you ever tear somebody down with your words? Or have you ever? Then you haven't fulfilled that command perfectly. Have you ever naturally resented someone because they have something that you want? Have you ever been jealous of someone and therefore avoided talking to them? <clears throat> of course you have. All of us have. You and I are all guilty of being unloving toward others. And God's standard requires us to be loving toward them all the time. You can't do it. The fundamental rules God has given us are to love him and to love people. And you and I and every person on earth cannot do it. But praise God, he provided the solution. Jesus loved God and loved people. You and I are born with a sin nature, but Jesus was not born with a sin nature. He was conceived miraculously in the womb of a virgin. Therefore, he did not inherit the sin nature of Adam. God the Son who is co-equal and co-eternal with the Father and the Holy Spirit, became flesh. He became human. Divine nature and human nature were united in one person, which is called... Go ahead, guys. Wednesday night, remember? The high... Okay, yes. I'll work on it. Hypostatic union. Idiot. The, uh, the, this, there's a truth called the hypostatic union, which basically says that divine nature and human nature divided, but it was one person, Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, we'll go over it again next <laughs> Wednesday. <laughs> Where was I? Jesus became human. Good. Okay, yes. All right. So that actually is what we're celebrating at this time of year, right? That Jesus became a man. Jesus was born as a little baby in Bethlehem. God came near and actually became one of us. We celebrate his birth because it was the beginning of the final phase of God's rescue operation for humanity. God came down. Jesus was born and lived about 33 three years on this earth. And he always loved God and he always loved people. He obeyed the greatest and first commandment. All of God's commandments were met, always with the right attitude, always with the right motive. He obeyed all the time with his whole being, absolute perfection. 
In John 14, 31, Jesus said, I do as the Father has commanded me. In John 17, 4, he said, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. In Hebrews 10, Jesus said, I have come to do your will, O God. He trusted the Father. He obeyed the Father. He glorified the Father. Jesus loved God perfectly. And how did Jesus treat people? How did Jesus treat his neighbor? He healed them. He taught them about God. He showed compassion. One of the uh, <clears throat> best examples of this, I think, is the little man Zacchaeus, the tax collector. Jesus came to his town one day, and you'll remember Zacchaeus because he was a tax collector, meant that he was a Jewish man who was collecting taxes from his fellow Jews to give to the Romans. So he was regarded as a traitor to his country. And in addition to that, he was most likely a thief because the tax collectors would collect extra so that they could pocket the difference and get themselves wealthy. Absolutely despised. He would have been a social pariah. No one would invite him over for Scrabble night. Uh, no one would want to talk to him, sit beside him in synagogue, any of that. And Jesus invited himself to this man's house. Jesus reached out in love to this man who was absolutely unlovable, despicable man who'd betrayed his own country. And Jesus reached out to him in love. And of course, the greatest act of love in all of history, Jesus gave himself to be crucified for our sins, allowing himself to be tortured, allowing himself to be mocked, ridiculed, and humiliated, and ultimately murdered. Mark 10, 45 says, the Son of Man came not to serve, but excuse me, not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He offered himself as our substitute, receiving our punishment. Isaiah 53, 5 says, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. You and I can't love God and love others, but Jesus has perfectly loved God and loved others. And that's good news, but only because of what happened at the end of his life. Because if it was only this perfect example we had to look to, we'd still fail, right? Because all of us know about Jesus' perfect example, and we're still not perfect. We still can't live up to that. But because at the end of his life, he said, I'm going to take the punishment for all the times you guys have not loved God and not loved your neighbor. All the sins that you have committed, I'll take the punishment for that. The transgressions for our, excuse me, the punishment for our sins was laid upon him. And that's what makes this next step possible. Because after he was crucified and risen from the dead, he now offers forgiveness to everyone who will come to him. Just trust in him. That's what he says. Come to me and I will give you rest. Come to me and I will give you life. I will give you forgiveness. <clears throat> His obedience then, once you trust in him, is counted as your obedience. You stand righteous before God because everything that Jesus ever did is counted to your account. So it's not just that we have this beautiful and perfect example to look to, but we take that beautiful and perfect example that comes into our life and God says... I'm going to treat you like that was you. I'm going to treat you as if you never sinned, as if you always loved God and loved your neighbor. Romans 6, 5 and 6 says, For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we, no longer, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. Not only are your sins forgiven, but you have been made new and you have been indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. And now the power of Christ is working in you to truly, sincerely love God and love your neighbor. It will still be imperfect and inconsistent, but it will be real. It is acceptable before God to, in Christ because of uh, what he has done. So here's the point. In Christ... Love God and love people. In Christ, love God and love people. Outside of Christ, you cannot love God. And consequently, you cannot love your neighbor with a godly love. But when you put your faith in Jesus, you are united to him and you are made new. Your status before God moves from enemy to beloved child forever. <clears throat> and you're changed. You're made new. The Holy Spirit within you is working to transform you more and more into the image of Christ. And you will continue being changed for the rest of your life. God is at work to make you holy. God is at work to make you Christ-like. In Christ, love God and love people. You've broken both commands. 
the most important and the second most important. But Jesus perfectly obeyed both commands for his entire life, and then he died to pay the penalty for your sins against God and people. What I want you to leave here today is knowing is that if you trust in Christ, <clears throat> excuse me, if you trust in Christ, you can rest in being accepted before him, and by his power you can actually strive to love God and love people. Your status before God is, as beloved child is secure in Christ. It isn't affected by your obedience because if it was, one day you'd be his child, one day you'd be his enemy, and you'd be going back and forth. But you're a beloved child in God because of what Jesus has done, not because of what you have done. But now the new life that is within you is compelling you and moving you to love God and to love people. In Christ, love God and love people. Well, let's look for just a minute at how we can take that truth to heart. How can we respond to this word from God? I have a few suggestions for you, as we do every week. First suggestion, rewrite, re, try that again. Rewrite Matthew 22, 34 through 40 in your own words. Uh, as you know, whenever you try to rephrase something in your own words, it forces you to really think about what it says. It forces you to really understand what's going on. And that's the reason students, the teachers do that to you sometimes. Rewrite this in your own words. And you're like, man, this author wrote it just perfectly. I can't do it any better than him. But by writing it in your own words, you're going, okay, I understand what he is saying. And therefore, I'm going to uh, say it in a different way. Rewrite that in your own words. Another idea, and this is uh, hopefully to build community as, to well, as, as well as to uh, help the message of the sermon Move into your heart. Discuss the sermon with others. What stood out to you? What resonated with you? Was there anything you disagreed with? Uh, do you think Slade is not that handsome? That kind of thing. Just <laughs> discuss the sermon with others to really uh, uh, help it move more into your heart and mind. Another idea, you can ask the Lord to enable you to love people that are difficult to love. Now, this command is much easier to follow if you focus on people that are easy to love. I mean, I don't know how many of you guys know Bob Coleman, but Bob Coleman is easy to love. He's pleasant. He's encouraging. He's generous. He's just, a, he's got a phenomenal personality. So it's easy to love Bob Coleman, but it's much harder to love that mean, foul-mouthed co-worker that you have to work with every day. It's much harder to, to uh, love the annoying, self-centered kid that lives three houses down from you and comes over at the most inopportune times. It's midnight, man. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, that's what It takes the power of the Holy Spirit to love someone that is unlovable. And so pray for God to enable you to show love to someone that is difficult to love this week. <clears throat> and finally... As a way of practicing this message, give to one of the ministries that I mentioned at the beginning of the message, Legacy Closet, Christmas for the Least of These, Hannah House, the Weighted Blanket Serving Ministry, a Sewing Ministry, and uh, Beds of Hope. As a way of celebrating the birth of Christ, the greatest gift that God could possibly give his very own son, give to one of these ministries to meet a need in the lives of a child or in a family. It's a way to love God as, a, as well as a way to love your neighbor. <clears throat> now, once the service concludes, there's going to be people across the stage up here that are ready and willing and excited to pray with you. So if you have any needs that you want to bring, you can just come up here after everyone's exiting that way. You just come forward. They'll be delighted to pray with you. If you have a spiritual need, if you don't know the Lord and want to know the Lord, if you're facing some crisis in your life, just... Put aside your pride for a minute. Come up and talk to someone. We would love to, love to pray with you. So let's all stand. And uh, prayer team, you can come forward. Lord God, in the name of your great son, Jesus, I come before you today with a grateful heart, Lord, that you have loved me so boundlessly and endlessly and faithfully. God, thank you for that love. Thank you for every person that is in here today that knows you and has been rescued from slavery to sin and brought into the kingdom of light.
God, I pray that every believer's heart would be encouraged once again to love you more deeply, to love others. God, I pray that you would give us generous spirits. I pray that your Holy Spirit working through us would enable us to love those who are difficult to love, would enable us to reach out and pour out your love on the world around us. God, help us to meet a need. Help us to spread the gospel. Help us to touch the lives of those that you have brought into our circles. And God, if there's anyone in here that doesn't know you, I pray that your spirit would bring them the light of the knowledge of Christ. Show them that they are sinful and they have fallen short of your commands, but that Jesus stands ready to receive them, to wash them clean, to, to bring them into his family. God, I pray for your blessing over everyone that is here this morning. May there be a special measure of grace as they go about their week. In your holy name, I lift them all to you. Amen. You are dismissed. God bless you.